Hello, I'm Flint Whitlock from Denver, Colorado. I'm a military historian, author of a book called Soldiers on Skis. And uh, it was written because my father, Jim Whitlock, had been in the 10th Mountain Division in World War II, and I became interested in telling the story of the 10th. And so what I'd like to do today is give you a little bit more information about who the 10th was, why they were formed, where they fought, and what they did after the war, because no other uh, U.S. Army Division ever did the kinds of things that impacted civilian life the way the 10th did. So look, follow me and we'll take a tour through the museum. We're here at the Colorado Snow Sports Museum and we have a display here about a guy named Minnie Dole. Well, who was he? Charles Minot Dole was the head of the National Ski Patrol System. And prior to the outbreak of uh, the United States getting involved in, in the war after Pearl Harbor, uh, he saw what was going on in Europe and he saw the German armies and the Italian armies fighting in mountainous uh, terrain and, and in winter conditions. And uh, Minnie Dole realized that uh, if the U.S. ever got involved in the war in Europe, uh, we didn't have any troops that were specially trained for that type of uh, condition. And so what he did was he began writing letters to the Chief of Staff, uh, General George C. Marshall, and also to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, trying to point out this deficiency and, and urging them to consider starting uh, the training and formation of, of mountain troops. Well, Roosevelt and Marshall didn't want to know about that. They said, if we got involved in the war, then we're going to need more regular troops, infantry, armor, artillery. We don't need specialized mountain troops. And Minnie Dole was relentless. He sent probably a letter a day to Washington, D.C., talking about the need for this. And finally, I think Roosevelt and Marshall just got so sick and tired of getting these letters every day from Minnie Dole that they said, all right, you know everybody in the world of skiing. You're the head of the ski patrol system. You do it. And the Army authorized the National Ski Patrol System and the American Alpine Club to be the official recruiters for this new division. It's, that had never happened before. So this is something brand new. And it was all because of this, this one man and his vision and, and his desire to see this happen that the 10th Mountain Division actually came to fruition. So let's take a look around the uh, museum here and show you a little bit more about the history of the 10th. The 10th Mountain Division was unique uh, in, in one respect. It, it wanted young men who had uh, some experience, some skills in outdoor living. They wanted people who could survive in a harsh alpine environment. Uh, they wanted skiers, they wanted mountaineers, they wanted people like this. And so when Minnie Dole sent out his, his call to the ski areas and to all the ski teams and, and ski clubs around the country, uh, calling for volunteers, uh, they got a tremendous uh, response. There were 15,000 young men who wanted to be a part of this, this new uh, concept. Uh, and it was an all-volunteer organization to begin with. Uh, and each volunteer had to have at least three letters of recommendation from their uh, coaches, their ministers, uh, school principals, whoever it was, to attest to the fine character of these young men who wanted to be a part of this. One of the other things uh, that was unique about this division is that it, it attracted a great many foreign-born skiers and mountaineers uh, to, to join the unit. Uh, many had come over to the States in the late 30s. Uh, the war was just getting started in Europe, and they didn't want to be a part of it. They didn't want to be either occupied by the, the Germans or fighting for Hitler in the, in the Nazi armies. And so they came to the States, many of them came over as ski instructors, uh, ski coaches, and when they found out that there was going to be uh, this specialized unit, they, they really jumped at the chance to, to be a part of that. And so uh, they mixed with the other American boys uh, to create a really unique uh, type of, of organization. And it's one that uh, has no equal. There was never a division uh, before or even close to it afterwards. Let's look further on in the, in the museum here. 
The 10th Mountain Division was unique uh, in, in one respect. It, it wanted young men who had uh, some experience, some skills in outdoor living. They wanted people who could survive in a harsh alpine environment. Uh, they wanted skiers, they wanted mountaineers, they wanted people like this. And so when Minnie Dole sent out his, his call to the ski areas and to all the ski teams and, and ski clubs around the country uh, calling for volunteers, uh, they got a tremendous uh, response. There were 15,000 young men who wanted to be a part of this, this new uh, concept. Uh, and it was an all-volunteer organization to begin with. Uh, and each volunteer had to have at least three letters of recommendation from their uh, coaches, their ministers, uh, school principals, whoever it was, to attest to the fine character of these young men who wanted to be a part of this. One of the other things uh, that was unique about this division is that it, it attracted a great many foreign-born skiers and mountaineers uh, to to join the unit. Uh, many had come over to the states in the late 30s. Uh, the war was just getting started in Europe and they didn't want to be a part of it. They didn't want to be either occupied by the, the Germans or fighting for Hitler in the, in the Nazi armies. And so they came to the states. Many of them came over as ski instructors, uh, ski coaches, and when they found out that there was going to be uh, this specialized unit, they, they really jumped at the chance to, to be a part of that. And so uh, they mixed with the other American boys uh, to create a really unique uh, type of, of organization. And it's one that uh, has no equal. There was never a division uh, before or even close to it afterwards. Let's look further on in the, in the museum here. Now with all these young men coming into what would eventually become the 10th Mountain Division, they needed to have a place to train. Uh, they initially began training just before Pearl Harbor uh, in December of 1941 at a place in Washington State called Mount Rainier, you've probably heard of that, and at Camp Lewis. Uh, one of the things that um, they discovered was that they needed to have their own special training area, and so the Army began looking for a permanent home for the tent, and they found it here in Colorado at a place called, what they named Camp Hale, uh, which was about 10,000 feet up in the Rockies uh, between Minturn on the north and Leadville on the south along Highway 24. It was about 250,000 acres. Uh, the Army was going to have about 14,000 uh, men from the tent living there and about four to 5,000 pack mules and horses, which would be needed to carry uh, supplies and, and other equipment into mountainous areas where there were no roads where you could get trucks or jeeps or tanks. And uh, so Camp Hale was, was the perfect uh, site and uh, it took from about eight months, from April to November of 1942, to build this camp of over 800 buildings to house all of these men and animals. So there's a picture here showing uh, what the camp looked like after it was finished. Uh, it was very inhospitable. Uh, the weather, as you might imagine, in the mountains is not always uh, warm and sunny. Uh, there were blizzards. There was, um, you know, a great deal of difficulty uh, for for the troops. Many of the the young men who became part of the division uh, dropped out. They said they don't want to have any part of of this. Uh, my dad was drafted into it. He had no background in skiing, but uh, he, he toughed it out. He learned how to ski uh, at, in Colorado here and uh, went overseas with the division. But let's talk a little bit about the training of the 10th. The training for the 10th was, was really unique. Uh, it was unlike anything most of the other regular divisions uh, took part in. Uh, not only did they have to learn how to ski, they had to learn how to climb mountains. They had to learn how to fight in harsh uh, weather conditions. And, and it was just very difficult. Uh, they had specialized vehicles, such as this weasel, that uh, allowed them to go through the snowy tracked areas. Uh, and it was just, it was a very difficult kind of thing. And, 
and a lot of people like my father, who had never skied before, uh, had to learn a whole new skill set before he was be qualified as a, as a mountain soldier. And so the, the training went on and on and on, skiing in the winter, mountain climbing in the summer, and it got very boring. They were at, at Camp Hale from the, the spring and uh, summer of 1942 until uh, really the uh, summer of 1944 when they uh, thought that the, 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 that the division was going to be disbanded, uh, the, the men were going to be set off as replacements to other units because the Army couldn't figure out what to do with them. There was just no particular mission that they could, that they could perform. But those who stuck it out, uh, I think, really um, made a name for themselves and for the division. Now, there was, as I said, no real role for the division uh, in, the, in the European theater. Uh, but early on, in the summer of 1943, uh, there was one particular need for the division, what would become the 10th Mountain Division, and that was against the Japanese in the Aleutian Islands. The Japanese had captured two islands in the Aleutian chain, Kiska and Attu, and in the uh, early months of 1943, there was a tremendous battle that was fought to evict the Japanese from the island of Attu at the end of the uh, Aleutian chain. Well, the other island that the Japanese controlled was called Kiska, and they had been there for quite some time. They had set up a, a base, and it was probably in anticipation of an attack on the west coast of Canada and the United States. Well, the Americans and the Canadians didn't think that was such a great idea, so they decided uh, in August of 43 to mount an invasion of Kiska with 40,000 Canadians and Americans, uh, part of whom were from the 10th Mountain Division. Well, they arrive at the uh, island of Kiska and it's all fog shrouded and mountainous and the men go charging up into the hills and they hear noises in the, you know, off in the fog and they start firing blindly. Well, it turns out that they were firing on their own men and there were a number of casualties that were taken by the Canadians and also uh, the men of the uh, 10th Mountain Division. But you can see here there are some Japanese souvenirs that uh, the troops brought back with them when the action in uh, Alaska was over. Uh, but there was a uh, something that the Army said, well, we do have a role for you, but it didn't come until very late in the war. Let's talk about that. The Army had had a problem in Italy ever since uh, September of 1943 uh, when they uh, invaded the uh, peninsula of Italy, and that was the Germans were going to fight for every square yard of, of the entire country. Uh, Italy had officially dropped out of the war, but the Germans didn't leave, and so they were uh, trying to keep the Americans from coming up the peninsula of Italy and getting into the Alps and maybe invading Austria and Germany from the south. Um, so there's a general in charge of the Americans in Italy by the name of Mark Clark, and um, he'd, he'd run up into this uh, stalemate situation in the northern Apennines, north of Florence and, and Pisa. And when he found out that here was the 10th Mountain Division specifically trained for mountain warfare st sitting back in the States, he said, I want those guys. And so. Uh, late in 1944, the 10th Mountain Division got orders uh, to come to Italy. They took a troop ship, took about two weeks for them to get there, and they finally uh, arrive in Italy in January of 1945. And they were assigned uh, to the Northern Apennine region where the Germans were especially strong in the mountains. Uh, the Americans had been unable to, to uh, cracked through the German lines, and nobody really expected the 10th Mountain Division, guys who had never been in combat before really, uh, to do any better than any of the other divisions that had already, already tried and failed. So um, they said, you know, gentlemen, why don't you try uh, attacking through this uh, line, it was called the, the Belvedere uh, defensive line. And so the 10th looked at the terrain, they said, well, we, we can see how we have to go through here. And so they, they chose an area 
that was dominated by a ridge called Reaver Ridge. And uh, Reaver Ridge was the key to the, to the whole um, line of, of mountains in that area that guarded the approaches to the Po River Valley. And so after careful planning of several weeks, uh, an element of the 10th Mountain Division decided they would climb 3,000 foot high Mount or Reaver Ridge and knock the Germans off of there, which would then give them uh, a toehold in the mountains and enable them to break through. And that's exactly what, what happened on the night of uh, February 19th, uh, 1945. A uh, thousand men from the 10th went up the, the sheer face of Reaver Ridge, surprised the Germans on top, and by mid-morning uh, the next day they were in, in total control of that area, which then allowed the rest of the division uh, to break through the Mount Belvedere line, and they were followed by the 5th Army as they, they uh, continued on. As you can see here, there's a map here and some photographs of, of combat. Uh, one of the skis. Now, what was interesting too is that after two years of ski training, they practically never used their skis in combat. There were a few patrols in January and early February on skis, but after that, uh, it was just regular uh, combat uh, the way any infantry unit would do that. Let's take a look at the few artifacts uh, that we have here in the museum. After the 10th had shown its ability to meet the Germans on their own ground and defeat them, uh, Fifth Army, Mark Clark and, uh, and the Fifth Army decided, well, let's give them another test. So one of the things about being successful in combat is that you get to have more combat. Uh, the men of the 10th were up for the challenge, and so they spearheaded the drive into the Po River Valley, uh, and uh, the rest of the Fifth Army was following right along behind them. They get to the, the Po River. The Germans have blown the bridges there. Does, doesn't bother the 10th. They're, they're not an amphibious operation or unit, but they get some boats and they paddle across the, the Po River under fire, and they get to the northern bank, and they, they begin spreading out and chasing the Germans further northward. Um, th this was all something that, that the Army never believed that the 10th could do, but you know, the guys who could go through ten or two, two years of training in the, uh, in the Colorado Rockies, you know, nothing was going to, to stop them. And so they continued on and they got up to a place called Lake Garda, which is Italy's largest lake. And uh, they're getting very close to the uh, southern uh, foothills of, of the Alps, getting ready, hopefully, to, to get into Austria. And this was in, in late April. Uh, some very interesting things happened as we get into April. One of them was the fact that, that Bob Dole, who was a second lieutenant, was wounded seriously, lost the use of his right arm at that point. Uh, one of the, the famous members of the 10th, a Norwegian by the name of Torger Tokla, who was the holder of the world's record in the ski jump and had joined the 10th uh, from the very beginning, was killed during the April 14th offensive. Uh, so it was, it was a, a, a very trying time, but the 10th didn't let anything stop them, and they were on their way to Lake Garda. The 10th has now come to Lake Garda. This is late April 1945. They get up there, uh, the Germans are retreating as fast as they can, and the 10th the is taking one village after another. Uh, just shortly before the end of the war, which ended May 2nd in Italy when the German troops uh, surrendered there. Uh, the 10th at this point had an assistant division commander by the name of Colonel William Darby. You may be familiar with the uh, unit known as Darby's Rangers. Well, he had started the Rangers. They had fought in Italy. They'd been more or less wiped out. Darby uh, is assigned to be a regimental commander in the 45th Division which was a combination of the Colorado and Oklahoma National Guard. So he continued to see combat in Italy. When the assistant division commander of the 10th was wounded during this drive towards uh, Lake Garda, Darby is appointed assistant division commander of the 10th. Unfortunately, he is killed by what some people have said was the last uh, shell fired in anger by the Germans at a little town called Torboli near the, the northern end 
of Lake Garda. Uh, a, a real tragedy because Darby was a true American hero. But we have here some scenes, some artifacts, German equipment, uh, weapons, American equipment and weapons, an Italian Alpini hat, the Italian Alpine mountain troops. Uh, and then there's some pictures of the crossing of Lake Garda. Uh, it was noticed that there was a villa across the, the lake and the 10th Mountain wanted to, to get over there. It turned out to be Mussolini's villa. Let's take a look at that. We're now at Lake Garda and Mussolini's villa. This is a picture of it as it looks today. Uh, Mussolini had this as one of his many uh, palaces and homes. Uh, shortly before the 10th Mountain arrived here at Mussolini's villa, uh, he had been captured by uh, Italian partisans and assassinated, basically executed, and his body was taken to Milan and hung up upside down in a gas station. Um, the Tenth Mountain guys get to the villa and uh, they pick up all sorts of souvenirs uh, from, from his home, some of his medals and medallions that he'd been awarded uh, for the many years that he had been the dictator of Italy. Uh, and they brought these back as, as war souvenirs. But there was time for, for one last tragedy besides uh, Colonel Darby's death, and that was uh, as they were going across the lake in amphibious vehicles called ducks, uh, one of them was overfilled with about 24 uh, soldiers from the 10th, and they got out in the middle of the lake, and for some reason, it capsized, and 23 of the 24 men on board were killed, they were drowned. And just a few years ago, that duck was found at the bottom of Lake Garda in about 900 feet of water. There was no uh, sign of any human remains, uh, but every year the Italians who live around Lake Garda go out there on April 28th and uh, drop wreaths of flowers on the water as a uh, tribute to those who lost their lives to liberate Italy. Okay, now we have reached May of 1945. Uh, it was May 2nd, the German armies in uh, Italy said, uh, there's no way we could possibly win, let's surrender now. And so the, the general of all the German troops in Italy decided that he wanted to surrender to the 10th Mountain Division because he said that the 10th was his most formidable foe, which is quite an honor to, to have that happen. And so, on May 2nd, the war in Italy comes to an end. Six days later, the uh, Nazi government gives up, and the war in, in Europe is, is finally over. Uh, the boys of the 10th thought, well, time to go home, but there was still one more thing that they had to do. They were part of the army of occupation in Italy for a few more months uh, to make sure that there were no uprisings or, or other factions trying to gain power. And it wasn't until uh, the fall of 1945 that they fi finally got home. And in November, they came to Camp Carson in, in Colorado Springs, today known as Fort Carson, and uh, were uh, demobilized. And there was no more 10th Mountain Division for 40 years until 1985, when a new 10th was born at Fort Drum, New York. But the legacy of, of the 10th lived on, and it's still living. Uh, many of the men came back to the states, uh, got involved in, in ski areas, they started the whole resort of Vail, they got the uh, ghost town of Aspen started as one of the, the poshest ski resorts in the country. Uh, a 10th Mountain Division man founded uh, Arapahoe Basin. There were men from the 10th who were involved in various aspects of just about every uh, ski area and resort around the country that you could find and it was truly a testament to their love of the mountains and their devotion to winter sports that that made that happen uh, in 1959 there was a monument that was built uh, at the top of Tennessee Pass close to the Camp Hale training grounds between Minturn and Leadville and it was dedicated to the 1,000 men of the 10th who had lost their lives in service to their country. And this is the roll call of honor 
of all 1,000 men who were killed there. And I hope that if you have the chance, take Highway 24 between Minturn and Leadville, get to the top of Tennessee Pass at the entrance to Ski Cooper, which is where they did uh, their advanced ski training. And you'll see the monument there and, and the names of everyone who lost their lives. And give a silent thanks to those men who gave everything so that we could enjoy the liberties we do today. Thank you very much.